Hello, 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 everybody. This is Thinking to Think. Today, we're going to be discussing the craziness that's going on in Israel and Palestine, Gaza Strip. We're going to be discussing the moral issues, origins of the conflict, and basically what's uh, the current situation as of October 15th. So without further ado, let's get into it. So the moral issues, um, I think is best, like I've been saying in our in previous podcast episodes, we need to discuss definitions. You know, you need to understand clearly what you are, what the other person's saying. So we're going to define morals right now. I've defined it before, but I'm going to do it again. Morals is basically the standard of how you uh, how you act in, within a community. So it's basically your, your community's uh, beliefs, ethics, that type of nature. Okay, it's different from ethics itself because it is ethics is more of the self, whereas morals is the community uh, way of life. So, for example, uh, one the Aztecs it was morally justified to um, to do certain sacrifices, certain rituals, whereas other countries it is moral to. Uh, have the moral thing to do is to make sure you're, uh, you do arrange marriages. That is, that's fine. That's morals. Um, so now that we have that out of the way, um, this situation is, you know, a lot of people are saying it's moral. It's a moral issue. It's a moral situation. Like, go, oh, it's the right thing to do with, you know, go to Gaza, it's the wrong thing to do, what they did before. We're going to get into all that. It's, uh, it's a bit complex. I'm going to simplify it as much as I can. Um, so in Gaza, the, you know, the moral issue was the, uh, the, the treatment in Israel. This is the, the argument from the Palestinian point of view that uh, Gaza is basically a ghetto type of environment where they do not have the basic standards. Um, yeah, that is that is not indisputable. However, the um, in the Israeli point of view is that they have been giving aid, but the uh, local uh, government, which is run by Hamas, um, is not providing that aid they're taking and using it for weapons so um egypt and other countries are refusing to take in uh the palestinians it's very um and their concern is very honeycomb where they may have uh, pockets of terrorists within the refugees now that has happened in his in current history so their concerns are legitimate in that sense. That's why nobody's protesting against Egypt and other countries. Now, uh, when I hear about this complexity, I can't help but think of Thomas Jefferson saying regarding slavery, uh, it's like holding a wolf by the ears. So that's the predicament they were in. Now, um, this, you know, the whole protest that occurred over the weekend uh, protests and riots, uh, I would say, it, it's it's been kind of an eye opening, in in a sense that a lot of people don't know what they're talking about. Uh, for example, I saw uh, um, queers for uh, queers for Palestine, except Palestinians have laws against uh, LGBTQ activity, and I'll get into that, um, but. Um, the, you know, it, it, you can die. They will kill you if you are part of that community and you live there or were there uh, in general, even visiting. So that goes without saying there's a lot of um, 
nonsense going on. I, and I and I hate to say it, nonsense, but it is. We have to call it by by what it is. If you're going to protest, if you're going to riot, if you're going to... No, uh, excuse me. Let me take that back. Don't riot. If you're going to protest, you need to... You, you need to know what you're protesting about. You need to know. If you don't know and you're just going with the crowd and just trying to get, you know, social points, then I don't know what to tell you, except um, you're a useful idiot. So clearly, if you're listening to this, epi- uh, this episode or this podcast, you would know that you are not a useful idiot because you care about critical thinking. Let's talk about the origins of this conflict. Now, we're going to be focusing on the 20th century. However, this conflict, believe it or not, has been going on for over 5,000 years. Um, it, the, or, it's like that, uh, 30, I believe it's around, and I could be done, done the math wrong, but it's about 3,500 BC uh, when Is, uh, Israelis uh, migrated from um, from the eastern part of Egypt, uh, and they moved across uh, the desert, and they found and they went to Jerusalem. Um, that's indisputable. I know it's in, in the Bibles and the you know and in historical texts, uh, but there's evidence. This is not a um, this is not something that people say. Oh, it didn't happen. Like historians, archaeologists, they found evidence that this is true. So, having said that, um, the Muslim religion was established in the seventh century. Now, take a moment to think about that. That's around the year, um, in the year uh, six hundred, around there. So they were there for a while. So this whole thing about oh, they're stolen land. We're gonna get to that on why they're saying that. Now, um, the the Muslims rose up in mid seventh century, while the Roman uh, the Roman Empire was kind of degrading at that time, at the same exact time. So these Muslim empires that were uh, that were built, they basically crossed and pushed the Romans out of the Middle East because the Romans kind of like the United States was like the world police state and the world was a lot smaller. And I don't mean that literally. I mean that figuratively uh, due to transportation and technology. But Rome had most of Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. That was their territory and it got pushed. Um, It was the beginning of the end for Rome anyway. So it was bound to happen. So moving on. Um, now we're going to go into the 20th century. Oh, and I forgot to mention the uh, the Muslims pushed out the uh, the is the the Jews basically as part of this push for for land and conquer. So um, that is important to say. Now the 20th century, uh, around 1917, British did the mandate um, the Balfour de- uh, Declaration. Um, it was a promise to, it was basically a promise. Um, it was a public pledge that basically to establish a, a, a national home for Jewish people in Palestine. Now, um, it, was in, it was made during like World War I. World War I happened around, nine, uh, around 1914, 1918 and was included in the terms of the British mandate for Palestinian after the, the, the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire after World War One, So at World War One gets, an, uh, you know, Ottoman Empire gets dissolved, annihilated, and here comes, you know, like, okay, we're going to put this little piece of land. Now, to give you some context of this little piece of land, um, it's not even, uh, if I have to put it as a, as I can you can't even put it as a state. It would have to be like if you are from uh New York, it would be like the borough of Queens or Brooklyn. And like, hey, there's your country. So it was small. Or a a county 
depending on your county of New York, of, excuse me, of, um, of the like Florida or whatever state you're in. Um, for a country, it's pretty much like a city, uh, depending on your country size, of course. So it's really hard to try to, you know, I'm trying to give you a visualization. And uh, I would say a couple of hundred, a couple of hundred miles, if that. So that was their piece of land. Now, um, before we get in any further into the the 20th century history between what's going on in Israel, um, I w again we let's do some definitions. Now we hear a lot of the term Zionism or Zionists. Zionists are Jewish nationalist movement that has had its goal. And now this is from the Britannica, so it's not coming from me or some this Britannica. Um, the goal, this national movement for the Jews, uh, for the creation and support of the Jewish national state in Palestine, the ancient homeland of the Jews, Eretz uh, Israel, um, um, through Zionism, originate, originated in Eastern and Central Europe in the later part of the 19th century. It is, in many ways, a contribution of the ancient uh, attachment of the Jews and the end of the Jewish religion to the historical religion a region excuse me region of Palestine where one of the hills of ancient Jerusalem was called Zion so that's where it comes from so this hills the name Zion they were like this is going to be Jewish land for Jewish worshiping people um those are Zionists okay uh, moving on so, in 1936 was the Arab Revolt. Now, this is important. This plays a huge role on things that happen even today. The 1936-39 Arab Revolt in Palestine, later known as the Great Revolt. Al-Thora uh, Al-Kubra. I could be butchering that, and I apologize for any um, anyone that's Arabic that just got their ears hurt. So I apologize. Uh, or the Great Palestinian Revolt. Um, so, was a popular nationalist uprising by Palestinian Arabs in mandatory Palestine against the British administration of the Palestinian um, mandate, demanding Arab independence and the end of the policy of open-ended Jewish immigration and land purchases with the state goal of establishing a Jewish national home. The uprising uh, conceded with a peak in the influx of immigrant Jews, somewhere around 60,000 that year. The Jewish population, having grown under British um, auspices from 57,000 to 320,000 in 1935. This is, this is leading up to your World War II. Okay? The Peel Commission uh, happened. And they were wondering why this revolt happened. This is the Peel Commission. And it was a study on why the rebellion happened. The result was the aged old story. Two peoples, Jews and Arabs, wanted to govern the same land. So, their answer to this, now this is 1935. Two independent states with 80% land of, uh, for, to go to the Arabs. Remaining un and the remaining 20 under British control. However, the, uh, the Arab um, tribes and nations rejected it completely. All right? This is going into world... This is like heating into World War II. And when the Axis, which is your Nazis and your, um, and your uh, Italian uh, uh, fasc fascists, was up against the Allies... The Arabic countries allied with the Nazis. So you got to take that in. This is factual. This happened. This is in history books, if there are good history books. So um, there was even meetings of Adolf Hitler be, uh, meeting with Arab leaders. So this is, and there's pictures of them. They're talking. You see them smiling. It's a whole thing. Anyway, 
After World War II and the creation of the United Nations, in 1947, the UN voted to create two states. This is back, doing it again. Israel was original, originally, excuse me, going to, to be two small pieces of the land around the size or smaller than Gaza today. So it was going to be small. The Arabs said no. Um, now, before I continue, I, I have to, I can't stress this enough. This is, com this is all factual. This is indisputable. Okay? Plus, any additional information that I'm giving you is going to be, um, it's going to be from both sides. I'm taking it from both sides so I can give you this information. I'm not trying to, you know, give you propagandas uh, or anything of the sort. And I'm going to get to propaganda when we talk about current events. Um, but moving on. So, the Arab-Israeli War of 1948 broke out when five Arab nations, Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, invaded the territory immediately, immediately, following the announcement of the independence of the State of Israel on May 14, 1948. For Israelis, this was called the War for Independence. In their Declaration of Independence, they explicitly said, now this is not verbatim, but it is said, um, <clears throat> although it was it is a Jewish state. They welcome all, including Arabs. Like Arabs will be treated the same. Uh, in 1949, is and I'm going to get to the Palestinian point of view. In 1949, Israel repelled the Arab forces and occupied area we know as the West Bank in Gaza. It was actually, and which was at the time occupied by Jordan and Egypt. All right. Now here's the Arab perspective. Zionist military forces expelled at least 750,000 Palestinians and captured 78% of historic Palestine. Now, historic Palestine. Remember I did mention about the migration and um, uh, that was 3500 BC. But here we are. Um... The remaining 22% was divided into the West Bank and Gaza Strip. They, that's indisputable. The Arab also views this as the Palestinians were expelled by Zionist forces and that the exodus of 1948 was the fulfillment of a long-held Zionist dream to ethically, eth excuse me, ethically <laughs> cleanse Palestinian so that the land could then transform into the Jewish majority state. Every year on May 15, Palestinians around the world, numbering about 12.4 million, mark the Nakba, or catastrophe, referring to the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians and the near total destruction of Palestinian society in 1948. So you see there's two histories going on. The only thing that they have that agree on is the fact that Israel won at the, that war. So, but it was five countries also. So that, if you look at it in a logical war tactic, that is insane. That is insane. In any case, moving on. In 1967, Jordan, Egypt, and Syria fought Israel again. This is called the Six Day War. This is where it gets even crazier. This led, in six days, this led to Israel taking Egypt, all of Jerusalem, Gaza, and, uh, and parts of Syria. In a meeting, Israel was split on deciding what to do with the new territory. Now, here are their choices. Either, and this is in exchange for peace, they will return the West Bank to Jordan and Gaza to Egypt, or give the region Arabs the territory to build their own state. And the Arab League summit that year concluded, now this is the famous three no's, no peace, no recognition, and no negotiations with Israel. Now this ends 
with uh, many countries ar around the, the Abraham Accords with uh, former President Trump. And I'm going to get to that too. In 1979, a peace deal was made that Israel will give the entire uh, uh, Sinai uh, desert to, oh, excuse me, but shortly after, uh, this was the Sinai desert to Egypt, but shortly after, the, um, the Egyptian leader was assassinated. Like, right after he broke from the three no's. So, that's unfortunate. Uh, 1995, oh, and, they, and Egypt did still keep the Sinai Desert. In 1995, the Oslo Accords, um, peace talks that were on and off that eventually led to the Camp David Summit of 2000. Now, this is uh, President, uh, former President Bill Clinton at the time. Um, in, to, in, this, in this summit, Camp David summit, uh, Fur Barak, who was the Israeli prime minister, and Yasser Arafat, the, uh, the PLL, or the um, Palestine Liberation Organization chairman, uh, met with President Clinton at Camp David. Arafat was offered a Palestinian state of all of Gaza. 94% of the West Bank and east of Jerusalem as its capital. That's a lot. Arafa and all, and in return, be recognized as a Jewish state, the, is, Israel, and peace. Uh, he said no. So I think Bill Clinton famously said, um, uh, in these 14 days, all, um, all he said was no, or something along those lines. Um, but here's the thing. Shortly after those talks, there were a series of suicide bombings in Israel. In 2005, Israel left Gaza. They left Gaza. So take a moment to think about that. But the Palestinians turned Gaza to a base and launched attacks on Israel. And so Israel went back, obviously. In 2008, Fur al uh, offered a Palestinian state, offered additional land, additional land on top of everything else that was previously promised. That's, you know, Palestinian, uh, the Gaza uh, Strip, 94% of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. So they were going to offer more land. And it was rejected. So, fast forward to uh, President Obama. During this administration, this is where it gets like really bad. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm stating this as a fact, not as an opinion. When I say really bad, is that it creates instability in the Middle East further, and I'm going to explain that for context. Okay, this is not my opinion. Okay, people that are reflecting on the decisions made are basically. Not happy with these decisions. So hindsight being 2020, Monday night quarterback, and whatever you want to call it. Okay? All right. So for in order to bring Iran to the fold, and we had problems with, um, with um, I think it was uh, the Saudis or, anyway, uh, more support for Iran was given to help balance the Saudis. Uh, but this created an issue which created an ongoing conflict in Yemen. So this is something that's going on even today. Saudis decided Israel was not the problem. Iranians are. So this is slowly leading up to the Abraham Accords. Okay? Um, they gave money. They gave um, su support um, to Iran. This is the United States, which created instability in the Middle East. Um, Iran and many countries... They don't get along. They do not get along. And I'm going to explain that a little bit further. Okay. Um, in 2020, that's the Trump peace plan between Israel and Palestine was heavily in favor of more territory for Israel. Okay. But turned a cold peace to a warm peace between Israel, Emirati, and the uh, the Bayern or the, what we know as the United Arab Emirates. Egypt became more favorable towards Israel due to the issues with Iran. So Egypt, Saudi Arabia, um, 
UAE, the United Arab uh, Emirates, they're not fans of Iran. And so they actually become a little bit warmer with the Israeli state. Now, Israel does have an Arab population and is recognized. This, there is even a Supreme Court uh, judge who is Arabic and Muslim. Um, that he's he's still in the uh, he's still in the court. Okay, um, this leads up to the current situation, which is going to full circle on why I said the support that happened in Iran was actually not good. And I'm going to give you context with this. So, ah, disputes and claims. Israel Israel installed roadblocks after Hamas called for attacking Palestinian Jews in the streets. They were getting attacked. They were getting filmed on TikTok. They were getting, you know, it was bad. And they were being celebrated for attacking these uh, Jewish Palestinians. They canceled their elections. Now, Hamas has, I believe, a two, four-year term. And I could be mistaken. I should look that up before. Um, but... They do have a term limit and a certain amount of years per term in, uh, in that region. And they haven't, they've been in power for 16 years. Like they had no election. So, you know, again, when you see protests and like, oh, they're, and you seeing all hearing the propaganda about, oh, they're a democratic state and all these other things, they're, they're, they're either, they're either, um, lying to you or they genuinely do not know that this is occurring so uh when the riots happened in the border they oh and by the way it got suspended again in another election that was supposed to occur um when the riots happened on the border this is where they put down their guns and everything but what they did in return is they brought a bunch of rocks and stuff and they rioted at the border so it is a riot it's not a, it wasn't a protest Protest is peaceful, to share their word. Riot is where you're seeking violence within that, uh, within the peaceful group. And then you're trying to break out and you want to cause damage. So, um, um, and many said uh, they, they went over to the, uh, the Hamas went over to the, um, the Temple Mount, which is a holy place for Muslims. Um, but the thing is, they had... The Muslims had access to the Temple Mount. And there's even videos and pictures of thousands of Muslims um, during, a, I believe it was Ramadan, um, not to, um, the previous Ramadan, like praying. So they had access to it. So it's, I don't know why, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confused because based on my research and I'm looking Al Jazeera, I'm looking through, you know, um, CNN, I'm looking through all these things like, um, you know, BBC. And I don't know why, I, and I'm assuming it's social media that's infused, you know, that's flaming this lie. Because they had access since 1967. So, in any case, Hamas took over the, uh, the temple and began to attack police in which the Israelis shut down. And then they claim that Israel's being aggressive. This is, this feels very similar to the riots of 2020. And I want you to take that in for a moment. Sheet Shura belongs to the Arabs, but the history claims it was also Israeli, the Shet Shura. Um, I could be saying that wrong. Uh, again, I apologize. Um, it's not intentional. The claim is part of the deal, which was not met, so they needed to evict people living there. So what this was, the Shet Shura area, is um, basically because it was all, it was Arab, but you know it was a dispute of who owns the land and property, they said, okay, well, you can live there, but it's kind of like a long-term lease. You just got to pay rent. Two buildings, um, nobody was paying rent, and they got evicted. So now they're saying that 
um, they're kicking out a bunch of people and making them homeless and unlivable. So yeah. Now, foreign aid was given to Gaza for years. Years. But Hamas government has been using the funding for weapons instead of building infrastructure. So, here's the dispute that we're seeing. Okay? You have Israel stating that we're helping them, we're giving them support, but we have to give it to the government, and the government is say, is taking it and using it for weapons. I mean, to be able to have to have barely any infrastructure and have poor living conditions, but yet able to afford rockets and put them in civilian terror, which they do, and it's, it is a strategy. This is a known fact. This is undisputed. This is a known fact. Uh, they claim this, and I'm gonna I'll get to that in a moment. Um, that raises questions because logically that doesn't, you know, you have to think critically. That doesn't seem to make sense. Meanwhile, the other side is saying they are not getting it, but yet several countries and organizations are saying they are. So there you go. Now, Hamas attacked Israel on, uh, on October 8th of, uh, 2023 using land, sea, and air. More than 700 Israelis died. Um, the number is kind of clouded. Some say 600 and something. Some say 700. Some say 1,000. Uh, what's worse, they were attacked indiscriminately, and women and children were kidnapped and brought back to Gaza. It is reported as of October 12th, 2023, that they were being used as human shields. And I believe um, on... October um, 13 or 14, uh, which of this recording is about yesterday or the day before, that the uh, the military leader of Hamas uh, was killed um, from Israel, by Israel. So, um, that, again, it, uh, this is not just Israel, it's not propaganda. Hamas has officially stated that they are doing this. They have, you know, people, uh, they have people and that they, you know, they're not afraid to, to kill them and, and what have you. So this is, again, indisputed. Now, um, there is fog of war. And what those fog of war means basically is propaganda, not knowing all the information, um, there is a saying, and and the saying goes, um, and I think it says uh, something along the uh, lines of, in war, uh, truth is the first um, casualty. Um, I don't know, and I want to give credit, so let me look this up real quick on who said this. Um <laughs> Oh wow. Uh as uh Asilis? Hmm. But uh I can't pronounce that person's name. Wow. But uh that cannot that that is so truthful. In war, truth is the first casualty. So we as critical thinkers have to take a step back. Um I could have recorded this podcast episode immediately as it happened and gained Thousands and thousands of more listeners. However, I didn't want to do that. The reason why is because, first of all, you cannot just take things in face value. You have to analyze what's going on, figure out why it's happening, and make conclusions on yourself. You know, and that's what we do as critical thinkers. You know, we cannot just emotionally be charged. Um, my morals and ethics align with. Um, you don't kill innocents. You don't. You avoid innocents. You avoid ca um, as much uh, innocent casualties in war as possible. Um, but I do know that in history, war is ugly, and it happens, and it will happen, and it continues to happen because that is part of war. Um, the videos, and um posted by both Israel, um, 
Israel and Hamas are tragic, heartbreaking, and infuriating. Um, but that's my morals and ethics. So I have to take a step back and give you guys as much truth as possible that I can, that I have to the best of my ability and have you guys think more critically. So, um, you know, um, last week or around this, a few days after the, in, the attacks in Israel, um, Israel ordered the evacuation of over a million people in Gaza out. Hamas has ordered them to stay, that they will not leave, that they are patriots and blah, blah, blah. That's their excuse. Um, there's no way in history that 100% of any population in recorded history agrees with a particular government. There's some that will forcefully say they agree, but journals, primary uh, and uh, other primary sources will will differ, and secondary sources will will say different in history. So I do not believe that every uh, Palestinian is you know is Hamas, nor believe that you know, nor would I believe that every Hamas is Palestinian. But that's another conversation. Um, but they have also a history of using civilians as shields. You know, they use for martyrs. Ah, anyway, um, there were major protests throughout the world. Now, this full circle, I mentioned I was going to speak about this um, in favor of Palestinians, um, queers for Palestinian sons. That blew my mind because I know very well that there are certain countries that will kill you if you are part of the LGBTQ community. Or at least arrest you. At least arrest you. Okay. Um, BLM stating the decolonization. They clearly don't know history. Because who's to say it was the Palestinians that, you know, what are we basing it off of? And it infuriates me when people say, oh, decolonization. Like, who are you referring to? You know, granted, I can give you the whole like, oh, you know, Native Americans, you know, own, you know, we're, you know, we're in, we're ba this is the uh, United States is Native American land. I can get, I can give you partial credit for that. However, to assume that every tribe was the same is insane and infuriating because that's very, that's very racist, basically towards natives, towards indigenous people, because they had different cultures. They had different, depending on the region, depending on the tribes, there were different, there were different groups. That's like saying all oh, Hispanics are the same, and I'm Hispanic. That is insane. It's, 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 it's wrong, it's racist to even say that. So, going back, decolonization, like who are you referring to? Are you referring to the 20th century decolonization? Or we're talking about the first people, because if you're talking about the first people, Jerusalem is 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 uh, the Jews. Okay. Are we? You know, if we're talking about uh, the seventh century or the twentieth century, I can I can uh, then okay. But what are you referring to? And if you're referring to twentieth century history, but yet still say that Native Americans, uh, you know, we have to go back to Native like. You know, it doesn't really, the conclusion does not represent the premises. It's, it's not true. So it's not logical. So, um, the Democratic Socialist um, Organization. Now, this is your, the squad or card members. They're in full support of Palestinians. And just so happens that the, con uh, the Congress members of those organizations are not saying anything. And sometimes silence, like what they, like what they said in 2020, 
during the protest and riots. Sometimes silence is, you know, is the one that speaks to, is speaking the loudest on our support. So it's funny how when it's flipped on the the far progressive left that it becomes a, a um, paradox. They don't know how to respond. So, it, it you know, it, for, for these groups, I can't help but think is nothing but truth but power, uh, which is unfortunate. It's unfortunate to those that do get discri- uh, discrimina- uh, discriminated and they use, you know, these organizations use them to a to a clutch and it, it's it, it's just so infuriating anyway um now should the united states al uh, go in with israel and attack here's my concern i am not a war i'm not war drumming or anything of the sort um i'm not that uh, i'm not some of these these idiots in the senate that we're saying we need to send troops and, you know, go after Iran. I'm not saying that, not even the slightest. Here's what I am saying. We're going to base everything on facts. We have a lack of recruitment. The recruit, the recruiting uh, issue we have for our military force is, um, is a serious problem. Uh, most young people are overweight and unhealthy with mental issues. They can't even get into the infantry. Um, they clearly lower their standards because some are, but, um, but that, that's, it's a problem when, when you, when a young man, and I say young man, because relatively speaking, combat arms are usually heavily, um, male. I know females can get into the combat arms. I'm not disregarding, uh, females say males I'm, t- I'm referring to males because they're the majority of that group okay so they can't even do 50 push-ups i am not of drafting age i'll say that i did the um, you know i went into rotc i got commissioned and i ended up resigning my commission whole other conversation but i can say this I can do 50 push-ups and no problem. And I am in my, I'm, I'm already in my forties. So I'll say that. Um, so to say that an, an 18 year old can't do 50 push-ups, that's a problem. That's a serious problem. And then a lot of them have mental health issues. Uh, the stresses of training and the stresses of war are very real. There's, you know, PTSD is very real. Um, it is, it's, it's frustrating. Now, having said that, we have in history, now we talked about the recruitment problem. So we do not have boots, we do not have enough boots to go on the ground. Um, in history, military, um, Overextended military do not work well. They they fail in history. We're talking about like from Alexander the Great going all the way to to um <clears throat> excuse me to um India overextending. We're talking about um the Nazi the Nazis during World War II trying to invade Russia. And then they had to worry about Britain, and then they had to worry about um, the Americans, and that actually went to Africa first before they went to um, Normandy. Um, overextended. There's no, I, I couldn't find any military. Rome was overextended. They had to deal with the barbarians of the north, um, and they had to deal with the Middle East. Overextended. This is. This, we we don't have the recruitment. We're overextended as a military force. And by going into the Middle East, again, while Ukraine, which I haven't really discussed in this, um, this podcast, 
And if you guys want to, leave a comment, send a message. I would love to go over everything that I went over, uh, just like this, but regarding Ukraine, um, we cannot defend Taiwan. We can try with our Navy. Yes, that's true. But you need boots on the ground. Boots on the ground, it was the hold territory. They hold the line. So, overextending. In World War II, we had two fronts. The main focus was not the Pacific. It was the European front. We used the Pacific as a way to keep them away. You know, we, it was heavily Navy focused with Marines going island to island. But the Marines are not the branch that they are like they are today. It, that was not the case during World War II. They were tough. I'm not, and please, Marines, I love you. My, you guys are awesome. I'm not, I'm saying the number, it wasn't like as many Marines. It wasn't as, you know, that type of thing. So now it's a fight. It's a great fighting force. If anything, um, the Army has a lot to learn from the Marines as far as how they've changed uh, in this fr between these past four years. Um, so having said that, during World War II, it was more like buffering. We weren't invading like Japan or anything of the sort. So we weren't overextended. This is an overextension. We would have to deal with uh, Russia's allies um, because Russia is still focused on Ukraine. They got them. By the way, I looked at the map. They got the territory they wanted. So I don't even know what's why there's no peace talk. Is like blows my mind. But anyway, enough about that. Um, the morale, the morale is so low. I speak to soldiers all the time. And they, everything I'm saying, they're saying the same thing. So, which leads me to the last thing of my concern regarding our military and our, our fighting spirit as a country is we have no unity. We are so divided amongst ourselves. Sun Tzu's Art of War is like, it basically states the best war is the one that you don't fight. So propaganda, everything that's going on that's dividing this country, it's working. I would, if I was a betting man, I would say um, no country will defeat the United States. The United States will defeat the United States. No country needs to raise a finger. Just let the crap continue regarding this unity. And that's a scary thing to think about. Which lead, you know, which leads me to conclude and the last thing I'll say about this is the the pictures, oh, I mean, with AI generated pictures, I'm very skeptical, but the videos, the live streams, the things that I've seen, they are um they're really sad what's going on in the Middle East and in Ukraine. I don't want this happening, but this is part of the, this, the world we live in. Uh, I believe that what uh, Jordan Peterson, Dr. Jordan Peterson says that, um, you know, you got to be a monster, but you got to be able to control yourself. I, I think that reigns true. Um, the only thing we can do is take care of ourselves, take care of our families, um, be critical thinkers, know what's going on to avoid another repeat of, you know, we're going to follow whatever the government says and just go into places where, you know, the government tells us to and be rah-rah about it and for no reason except personal gain so um, I ask you guys to take care of yourself take care of others and be critical thinkers think critically um, 
I appreciate all of you. Share. Please like, five star it, share it. Um, I don't pay for marketing at all. So the only thing I can do is ask you guys to just um, share this podcast, help people become critical thinkers, get them out of that weird mental bubble that they're in, and let's build a thinking society together. So thank you again. Oh, and last thing, and it's a plug. I wrote a book. It's called uh, <laughs> The Logical Mind. Um, learn to learn to make better decisions through uh, through uh, critical thinking. It is on all your any of your bookstores that you like to buy a book. Just look for M A Aponte, or you can just look for The Logical Mind. You should be able to find my book. It is a I like to say it's a great book. And I worked really hard on it. Uh, I've been working on it for years, actually. That's one of the reasons why uh, this podcast took a long break. Uh, that and I had another child and I was getting another degree. So um, and I was running, I was helping running a school. Uh, so, um, yeah, check it out. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I have great projects on the way. I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, I will be working with a great organization. Um, if you have children and you are have conservative libertarian values, I'm going to recommend the Tuttle Twins. And if you have teenagers, watch out for a course that I've created, I'm teaching, coming next year. So be on the lookout for that. I will talk more about that. It's great. I've been working hard, working um very uh, digitally with Connor Boyack, author and creator of the Tuttle Twins. So I am excited. I hope you're excited. Please, again, share this podcast, share this episode. Let's build a thinking society. I appreciate you. I love you guys. All of you are awesome. And have a safe and wonderful day. Bye.